Krishnaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane, Namaste Sarasati Devi, Gauravani Pritarina, Nirvishesha Sanyavadi, Pascacate Satarini. Chapter 5, entitled Vidura's Talks with Maitreya, text number 40. 40, yeah, 40. Um. Data. Yad, yad, Ashmin, Ashmin, Baba, Baba, Isha, Isha, Jivas, Jivas, Tapa, Baba, Trayen, Abhihata, Trayen, Abhihata, Na, Na, Karma, Karma, Atman, Atman, Labante, Labante, Bhagavam, Bhagavam, Sabangri, Sabangri, Chayan, Chayan, Sa, Sa, Vidyam, Vidyam, Ata, Ata, Ashrayena, Ashrayena, Datur Yadasmin, Baba Esha Jivas, Datur Yadasmin, Baba Esha Jivas, Tapatrayena, Bitahatas, Nakarma Tapatrayena Vidhanasana Atman Labante Bhagavam Stavangri Atman Labante Bhagavam Stavangri Chayam Savidyam Asha Ashrayema Chayam Savidyam Asha Ashrayema Tatur Yadasmin Bhavata Isha Jivas Tatar Yadasmin Bhavati Isha Jivas Tapatrayena Bihahatta Na Karma Tapatrayena Bihahatta Atman Labante Bhagavan Stavangri Atman Labante Bhagavan Stavangri Chayam Savidyam 
O Father, O Lord, O Personality of Godhead, the living entities in the material world 
can never have any happiness because they are overwhelmed by the three kinds of miseries. Therefore, they take shelter of the shade of your lotus feet, which are full of knowledge, and we also take shelter of them. Everyone please repeat. O Father, O Lord, O Father, O Lord, O Personality of Godhead, O Personality of Godhead, the living entities, the living entities in the material world, the material world can, never have any happiness. can never have any happiness. Do you believe it? Yes. No? Because they are overwhelmed. Because they are overwhelmed by the three kinds of miseries. By the three kinds of miseries. Therefore they take shelter. Therefore they take shelter of the shade of the shade of your lotus feet. Of your lotus feet, lotus feet which are full of knowledge. Which are full of knowledge. And we also and we also thus take shelter of them. Thus take shelter of them. The way of devotional service is neither sentimental nor mundane. It is a path of reality by which the living entity can attain the transcendental happiness of being free from the three kinds of material miseries. Miseries arising from the body and mind, from other living entities, and from natural disturbances. Everyone who is conditioned by material existence, whether he be a man or beast or demigod or bird, must suffer from adiatmika, bodily or mental pains. Adibotic pains, those offered by living creatures, and adidaivika pains, those due to supernatural disturbances. His happiness is nothing but a hard struggle to get free from the miseries of conditioned life. But there is only one way he can be rescued, and that is by accepting the shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The argument that unless one has proper knowledge, one cannot be free from material miseries is undoubtedly true. But because the lotus feet of the Lord are full of transcendental knowledge, acceptance of his lotus feet completes that necessity. We have already discussed this point in the first canto. Vasudevi Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojata Jnana Yata Asu Vairagyam Jnanam Chayat Ahaituka. There is no want of knowledge in the devotional service of Vasudeva, the Personality of Godhead. He, the Lord, personally takes charge of discharging the, of this dissipating the darkness of ignorance from the heart of a devotee. He confirms this in Bhagavad Gita, Tesham Satata Yuktanam Bhajatam Priti Purvakam Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam Yenamam Upayantite. Empiric philosophical speculation cannot give one relief from the threefold miseries of material existence. Simply to endeavor for knowledge without devoting oneself to the Lord is a waste of valuable time. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militangena Tasmai Shri Gurave Shri Chaitanya Manobisham Stavitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uttapadakamalam Shri Gurum Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupa
So the, the demigods are describing how the material world is full of so many difficulties, so much suffering is there for everyone in the material world due to the effects of the months of material nature. People, all different living entities are suffering. It's not that all, only humans or only me I'm the only one suffering. Everyone's suffering, right? Every living entity. Lord Brahma tells us, Yes, Vendra Gopam, Atra Vendra Mahosva Karma, Bandhan Rupa Palapajanam Mapanoti, Karmani Nirdahiti Kintu Chabakti Bajam, Govindam Adipursam Tamaham Bajam. Lord Brahma is describing that. All living entities, from Indra, the king of heaven, to the tiniest germ that bears the name Indra Gopa, are all suffering and enjoying the results of their different activities in, according to their, in accordance to their previously performed work. But for a, one who has surrendered to Govinda, who has taken shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Govinda, then it burns up the roots of all fruitive activities. There's no more uh, suffering, no more of these material pains for one who has taken shelter of Govinda. So this similar point is made here by the demigods in their prayer to the Supreme Lord, that those who are properly situated will take up devotional service. Without devotional service, then we're simply under the influence of the material nature, right? We have to choose, either take the shelter of yoga maya 
or maha maya. <laughs> right? Yoga maya is very kind and merciful and gives shelter under the lotus feet of Govinda. But maha maya is a different situation. Under the spell of maha maya, we're trying to enjoy the material world. And the result is that we simply get so many difficulties which come upon us. And these difficulties are summarized in three different categories, right? Adi Baltic, Adi Atmic, Adi Daivic. So many different miseries in these three different categories. Miseries of this body, Adi Atmic, the body. So many parts are in our body. And they simply give us so much trouble and pain. It's so difficult to get pleasure out of this body. It's so easy to get pain from the body. You know, look, you can have, a, you know, your finger may get infected. It can give you so much pain, you so much discomfort. You know, a little infection in the finger and the whole body you may get a fever. And, you, you suffer so much. But can you enjoy with that little finger? Can you get any pleasure from that little finger? <laughs> Very difficult to try to get pleasure from. And, and if we analyze the different parts of this body, each and every part of this body can give us pain very easily. It brings us a lot of suffering. But to get pleasure from it, so difficult, so difficult to try to get some real happiness from this body. And then there's miseries also due to other living entities, adibotic. Other living entities, different creatures give us trouble. The fly comes, disturbs you all the time, right? Flying, and flying around, comes in your foot. <laughs> so many things. Mosquitoes come and bite you, suck the blood, the dog is barking. <laughs> little cat comes, you know, you're eating your prasadam. Little cat comes, meow, meow, you know. You want some prasadam, you know, you have to feed the cat. <laughs> so many disturbances. You work in a job, you work with sometimes nasty people. They're really unfriendly and nasty to you, give you a hard time. Or maybe your employer, you know, Luchendas Thakur talks about serving wicked and miserly people. Mm. We have to tolerate so many difficulties, so much disturbance. And then Adi Daivik, the miseries of the material nature. Too hot, often too hot. And then when it's not hot, then it's wet, pouring with the rain, right? And sometimes you get these tsunamis, sometimes you get earthquakes. You never know what kind of disturbance is going to come upon us. So there's so many ways in which this world is designed just simply to give us pain and difficulties. We try to make it comfortable, of course. We make our attempts to get pleasure in this world. To get a little pleasure, we have to go to so much trouble, you know, what you have to do. Just like when it gets too hot, we, we have these air conditioners, you know. Mm, we put in these air conditioners, and it's very common everywhere now, they have air conditioners. And what is the result of so many air conditioners? You get global warming, right? The whole planet becomes too hot. We, we enjoy a little. We're thinking it's very nice. We have air conditioning, comfortable, cool. We're thinking this is happiness. But Prabhupada mentions in the purport, he said, what we think is happiness is just simply relief from the suffering. We're thinking it's happiness. But actually, it's not real happiness. It's simply relief from the suffering. This is the illusion of happiness. Real happiness, we do not know, we, for, we fail to understand what is actually real happiness. 
Real happiness comes from the soul. We want to experience our spiritual nature. And then we can experience what is real happiness. So this instruction is, was given particularly in the Srimad Bhagavatam. There was one verse which Srila Prabhupada was very fond of speaking on from Lord Rishabde's teachings to his sons. Nayam deho deha pajam naraloke kushtam kamarna hati vid pujamdi techo divyam putrika yena sattvam shudayat jasmat brahmashokyam tvanantam. Lord Rishabde was re preparing to retire into the forest, accepting vanaprastha, giving up his kingdom and entrusting it to his sons. But before he entrusted, before he handed over everything to his sons, he gave them very important instructions. And I just quoted one verse which was very uh, important among his instructions. He's telling his sons that, my dear sons, there's no need of endeavoring for happiness of the senses. Because that kind of pleasure, that is available for even the animals which eat stool, like the dogs and the hogs. You know, they're, they, they're fond of eating stool. And they're thinking this is their happiness. So, people who just simply want sense gratification from the body, their happiness is similar to the happiness of these animals. In other words, it's low grade. It's a very low platform of happiness. It's simply the illusion of happiness. So Lord Rishabdev was instructing his sons. He had 100 sons. And he's telling them, don't try for that kind of happiness. He said, better you should do some austerities. as Tejo Divyam Putrikayena Sattva do some austerity and by doing some austerity you will purify your existence and then you will come to experience real happiness real happiness not that happiness like the pigs which eat stool but real happiness which actually comes from understanding ourselves as a spiritual particle part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. When we engage in the loving service of the Lord, then we can actually experience that kind of happiness. So therefore, Prabhupada, or the demigods are in praising like this, that we should take shelter of the Lord's lotus feet by engaging in his service. Taking shelter of the feet of the Lord means engaging in his service, taking up the activities of devotional service, beginning with hearing and chanting. So Srila Prabhupada explains here that people may argue that, oh, it's not enough just to do devotional service. You, you have to have knowledge. The real miseries of material existence can, can only be overcome by transcendental knowledge. And so people argue knowledge is important, not devotion. So Prabhupada argues against this by quoting the verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, from the first canto, second chapter, that when we do devotional service, one automatically develops no, causeless knowledge and detachment. Gyan and Vairag. Right? These two things follow wherever there is genuine devotion. Some, sometimes people ask, uh, how can we understand the merits of different spiritual processes? How can we understand which is actually the best process? So, an interesting example was given by one devotee. He, said, he, explained, he explained, he said, just like there are different currencies in the world, 
You know, you have the Singapore dollar, and you have Malaysian ringgits, and you have Thai bahts, you know, and Filipino peso, <coughs> Indian rupee. They all have their different values. What makes a difference to them? Well, we could say in the past it was gold reserves. Today more it's oil reserve. <laughs> you know, how much oil have you got? The people with the oil, that's the gold. Anyway, what, uh, you need some kind of resources to strengthen the currency. And on the, on the strength of your resources, then the currency has a particular value. So similarly, in different spiritual practices, there are also reserves or resources. And these are in terms of gyan and vairagya, knowledge and detachment. You have to look at the depth of knowledge and also the detachment which is there in each of the spiritual processes. And we have to examine that. Of course, some people may think that, well, Krishna conscious devotees, you people are not very detached. But we have to understand what is actual detachment, what is actual vairagya. People think vairagya means to give up everything, to stop everything. Some people think, I will not see any beautiful woman. I will go to cave. Yeah. <laughs> but that is not actually vairagya. Actual vairagya is to distribute Krishna consciousness to everyone. To the beautiful women also. Give them Krishna consciousness, distribute books to them, and engage them in Krishna service. We have to think how to give Krishna consciousness everywhere. So we do not have to give up everything, but we have to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. That is yukta vairagya, renunciation in relation to the Lord. Simply giving up everything, that is not actually renunciation. Rather, we have to understand that everything belongs to the Lord and it has a purpose, it's meant to be used. We have to know how to use everything properly for the service of the Supreme Lord. We can turn, for the service of the Lord, we can turn matter into spirit. Nothing is material for the devotee. We see everything is spiritual. We want to use everything. So a devotee is not afraid of the material world. A devotee simply sees Krishna everywhere. He sees everything in relation to Krishna. And he wants to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. Right? Some people are afraid of money. We don't want to touch money. Prabhupada said that's a joke. <laughs> who, who can live without money? It's just simply a, a sham. They're, they say, I don't touch money. Then how do you live? Oh, the money's below the table. Not on the table. Keep the money below the table. No, we, we have to use money. We have to know. We have to use it for Krishna. Prabhupada said, give the money to me and I will spend it all for Krishna. So that is Krishna consciousness. We don't have to give up the material world. That is actually Vairagya. So where there is genuine devotion, there will be these two things. There has to be both knowledge and detachment from the material world. So we can understand to come to that level of devotion requires that we have to also cultivate these two aspects. And factually, by practicing Krishna consciousness, naturally we will awaken knowledge and detachment from the world. It comes about naturally by engaging in this Krishna conscious process. Part of the Krishna conscious process requires us to hear and to chant. And by doing these two things, we will also develop detachment from the material world. It comes about 
naturally, without even trying for it, naturally one becomes detached from the world. The example is there, the, the hunter who Narada Muni got to stop trapping animals and the hunter took to chanting the holy name and then when Narada Muni came back to visit him, the, the man who had been a hunter, because he'd been chanting the holy name, now he no longer wanted to even stamp on insects. Little insects were moving in the path and he was very careful to sweep them out from the path. So that is the example of how a devotee, how one changes due to contact with devotional service. But if we simply take to the path of knowledge, simply want to become a jnani, renouncing everything, that is not going to be successful. Do people following the path of knowledge, do they make advancement very quickly? No, not at all. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bahu nam ginmanamante jnanabam mantrapajante After many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders to me. In other words, they're, they're making advancement slowly. It's taking time, a long time. How much time? Many births and deaths before they come to the platform of real knowledge. And when one comes to the platform of real knowledge, then they surrender to Krishna. Vasudev Sarvamiti. Samahatma Sudurmava. Very rare. You can understand the process of Gyan, very difficult, very troublesome. Later in 12th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna also describes the process of Gyan. Klesho desham avyakta sapta chetasam. Klesha, troublesome. They're pro they make progress with great difficulty. It's so much trouble. But the path of bhakti yoga is not trouble. Rather, we take up the path of bhakti to get away from all the trouble. Right? There's so much suffering, so many difficulties in the material world, and we come to Krishna consciousness to get away from them. Four kinds of people come to Krishna consciousness. Chatur Vida Pajantimam Jnana Sukritino Arjuna. Arto Jignasur Artati Jnani Cha Bharatarshama. Four reasons why good people, pious people with Sukriti come to Krishna consciousness. And one of the major reasons of the four, distress. People are in trouble, they're in difficulty, but they come to Krishna for shelter. So the material world is like that. It's so much, there's so much difficulty, so much trouble. People are suffering everywhere we go. Not only people, the animals are also suffering. The birds are also suffering. The fish are also suffering. We think, oh, we're suffering. We don't think, what about all these other creatures? How oh, they're also suffering. You know, we're trying to kill them, the birds. Do they get their food very easily? No. The government don't want you feeding the birds, right? <laughs> don't have all these birds coming, passing stool here. Let them go to the forest. They go to the forest, people hunt them. The fish, we're putting so many things into the sea. The fish are eating plastic and garbage. People are eating the fish. So much suffering for the fish, for the people. So much suffering for the animals in the jungle. They cannot live safely. People are hunting the elephants, the rhinos, all these creatures. None of them are safe. So just simply trouble everywhere in this material. And it's not only on this planet. 
even in the higher planets. Lower planets, of course, much more suffering. Hellish planets, they're suffering there. But higher planets also, the demigods also suffering. They're also in anxiety. The demons are coming, going to take us, take out, take over the heavenly planets and take control. The demigods are also worrying about old age and death. They also worry about that. Indra worries, somebody's taking his position. So this anxiety is there everywhere in the material world. Why? Because people are so attached to the material body. We're thinking, I am this body. And we're thinking, life is meant to give pleasure to the senses. But we should understand the pleasure of the senses is simply the illusion of happiness. The real happiness is in the soul. And when we look within and understand ourselves as a spiritual being, then we can begin to understand what is real happiness, what is real pleasure in life. So real pleasure comes from, first of all, self-realization, recognizing who I am, why I am here. That's the beginning. Before we can understand Krishna, before we can understand God, we have to understand who I am. If we don't know who we are, then we won't be able to understand Krishna or the Supreme Lord. So these demigods, they're in a nice position. They understand more about their own position. Demigods are obedient to the plans of the Lord, to the orders of the Lord. There are two classes of people described in Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 16. There's the divine and there's the demoniac nature. Now those who have divine nature, this is like these demigods, these beings on the higher planets called demigods who are controlling the material nature. They're administrative agents on behalf of the Supreme Lord. So they have a nice position in the material world. However, they're not fully pure devotees. While they are devotees, they're not totally pure devotees because they do have some identification and some attachment with this material existence. Just like all of us, you know, we have some, also some attachment to this material world. We are trying to be devotees. Mm, we're working on it and trying to gradually give up the attachments. So the process is bhakti yoga. We engage ourselves in the this process called bhakti yoga, which comes generally before we come to bhakti yoga, we should begin by performing what we call karma yoga. Karma yoga is working, performing activities for the pleasure of the Lord, giving up the results of our work for the satisfaction of the Supreme. And this is something which is much easier for us to do than bhakti yoga because to actually perform bhakti yoga there should be some knowledge and detachment. There sh it should be also there within our devotion. But by doing karma yoga, by sacrificing the results of our work, for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord, then we, we qualify ourselves to get more knowledge and understanding. Generally, one who is doing karma yoga, he doesn't really know much. He doesn't understand that there's a, the, this one Supreme Lord of everyone. He just simply wants to offer something. He wants to give the results of his work for the Supreme. Who is the Supreme? He's not very sure, but he knows there's some 
on Supreme. But because he's doing that kind of work, he becomes qualified to get the association of devotee. It is important for us to understand the, the need for association with devotee. Because in the association of devotees, then we will receive this knowledge. We may be working and giving the results of our work without actually knowing very well what we're doing or why we're doing it. But because we have some contact with the devotee, then the devotees, they will give us the devotion. They will give us that bhakti, which gives us also that knowledge and detachment. So without having the contact with devotees, we won't be able to get that real bhakti. Because bhakti comes from one who is a bhakta, one who has got devotion. We have to connect, therefore, with the devotees. Sometimes people ask us, is it important, you know, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm giving this, but what about the associate, do I need to come, do I need to hear, do I need to associate with devotees? It, it, it's very important. It's really essential if we want to actually come to the platform of genuine bhakti. Because on the platform of bhakti, there will be also knowledge and detachment from the world. It has to be there. Otherwise, then we, we may only be doing karma yoga, it may not actually be bhakti yoga. So it's important for us to come to cut this higher platform of bhakti yoga. Because on the platform of bhakti yoga, then we are getting direct union with Krishna. Prabhupada quotes to us from the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita from the four, one of the four verses, the Chatur Sloki of the Bhagavad Gita. He Prabhupada quotes this third verse. To those who are constantly devoted to me and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. So this is Krishna's reciprocation with his devotee. Krishna reciprocates with those who have bhakti. He doesn't reciprocate like that with a jnani or, or with a karmi also, one who is just simply doing karma yoga. Krishna doesn't reciprocate the same way. But this is a special relationship for those who have got real bhakti real devotion, who want to simply give loving service for the satisfaction of the Supreme Lord. So when we do our chanting, it's important to do that in the mood of devotion. That I'm chanting simply for the pleasure of Krishna. We should understand that in Bhakti Yoga, there can also be the influence of the three modes of nature. It's not just because we go on the altar and offer deity worship that this is bhakti yoga. You may be the pujari, you may be influenced by the mode of ignorance. You know, you may go on the altar, you didn't, you didn't take bath, you didn't put tea like on, you just woke up, you rush off, oh, I've got to do RT, oh, i got to do RT, <laughs> you, know, you know, and you go right, and you go in there, and, you know, and you do everything in a very haphazard manner. So that is more the influence of ignorance or passion at the best, you see. We are doing devotional service and similarly chanting Hare Krishna. We can be chanting Hare Krishna, falling asleep, you know, we're chanting. Or we can be hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, we sit in the class, you know, we go to sleep, you know, we don't give a lot of attention. 
So this is the mode of passion and ignorance influencing, although we are apparently it appears that we are engaging in devotional service, but we are being influenced by the modes of nature. We have to be very careful. We want to come to the level of real devotion, which means to get above the modes of nature, to transcend the modes of nature. Right? Rise above the mode, so Arjuna. We have to get free of this influence of passion and ignorance. We have to come to the level of goodness and then go on from the level of goodness to pure goodness, where one is fully situated in goodness. That is actual, actually the platform of devotion. Devotional service is at the top of the yoga ladder. When you, you've just been studying the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita in the Bhakti Shastri, those of you who were doing that, right? How many of you here were doing Bhakti Shastri? Yeah? Not many. No. Very less. You should try take the Bhakti Shastri course if you haven't already done it. Anyway, at the end of the sixth chapter, the yoga ladder has been described. And Krishna said, Yogi nam api sarvesham madgate nantaratmanam Of all yogis, one who is engaged in my devotional service, who always thinks of me within himself, then he is the highest yogi. Why is he the highest yogi? On that platform of bhakti, it includes all the yogas on the lower level. On the lower level, there is karma yoga, there is jnana yoga, there is dhyana yoga, and on the top level is the bhakti. And so just like one who has one lakh rupees, he has 10,000 rupees, he has 50,000 rupees, he has one lakh. Right? One like 100,000 rupees. So 100,000 includes 50,000, includes 20, includes 10. So one who is a bhakti yoga, bhakti yogi, he's also the best of karma yogis. He's also a jnana yogi. He's also a jnana yogi. He know, one who's doing bhakti yoga, he has to know about Krishna. Just like it said, there was one great Acharya, uh, Gorkishore Das Babaji Maharaj. He said he was practically illiterate. He could hardly write, could not read hardly. But he was a great devotee. Does it mean he didn't know anything? Did it mean he was ignorant, didn't know anything? No, he was a self-realized, he was a great self-realized Paramahamsa. And if any question was asked to him, he could answer. How did he know? Because his heart was so pure. Remember also, he used to go and hear from Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Although he may not read, spend much time reading himself, he would go and hear. And he had heard from great devotees like Bhakti Vinod Thakur and others. So he had heard and he had realized. And when people would challenge and ask him, he could explain, he could answer. And Prabhupada quotes this verse here from Bhagavad Gita. Krishna said, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. Out of compassion for them, I dwelling in their heart, destroy the darkness born of ignorance. So, for the devotee, for one who is actually devoted to Krishna, then the ignorance of the heart is removed with the lamp of transcendental knowledge. Prabhupada said, bring anyone to me, I can answer any question. He said, Krishna will tell me. Krishna will tell me the answer. So people say, how do you cure cancer? You say, chant Hare Krishna. Right? Chanting Hare Krishna, the cure for all disease. And so Prabhupada was teaching us that Krishna reveals everything to the devotee. 
one who takes shelter of Krishna by devotion. And devotional service means anya bilasita sunyam dhyana karma dhyama nanam pritam amno koyena krishna no shilanam bhaktir uttama. The devotional service means there's no desire for fruitive activity. We're not thinking, what will I get from Krishna? What will Krishna give me? We simply want to serve Krishna. No desire for liberation. A devotee does not even aspire to get free from material life, to get out of this material world. A devotee just simply wants devotional service, birth after birth. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Shikshastikam says, no desire to accumulate wealth or women or followers. I simply want devotional service, birth after birth. So he's not asking, oh, take me out of birth and death, I have to get liberation. No, devotee just simply wants devotional service. That is real liberation. So devotee has no desire for fruitive activity, He's not philosophically speculating. He's simply anukoyena uh, Krishna no shilanam. Krishna no shilanam. Everything in relation to Krishna is concerned with devotional service. Not only Krishna, but the different uh, incarnations of the Lord are also worshipped and honoured by the devotee. All of it. The, the, the different paraphernalia of the Lord, and the devotees of the Lord, right? even greater than the worship of the Lord, is the worship of those things in relationship to the Lord. So the devotees also honor all of the different Lord's paraphernalia and his different devotees. And the devotee is constantly engaged in the service of Krishna. It is not some intermittent thing, as Prabhupada begins at first part said, it's not sentimental, it's not speculative, but it's genuine devotion. We have to cultivate this taste for Krishna consciousness. We have to get some taste. In everything that we do, there has to be some pleasure, right? People get pleasure from something. They, some people get pleasure, they go to casino, they get some pleasure somehow. Go to a football match, they get some pleasure, you know? So devotee also, we have, we're, we have to get some real pleasure which is beyond the mind and senses. That pleasure comes about engaging in the Lord's devotional service. That uh, higher taste, just simply uh, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, uh, the embodied soul may be res restricted from sense enjoyment, <coughs> but the taste remains. In other words, the jnani, he stops everything. I want you know, I won't see, I won't touch, I won't hear. And he's trying to get some freedom from the material senses. But the taste for sense pleasure is still there, still within him. But he becomes fixed in consciousness by experiencing a higher taste. So devotees, we should be very anxious to get that higher taste. How do we get that higher taste? It comes about by sadhana, by practice. It may, be, it may come by mercy, but that's not very common, right? There is such a thing as kripa siddha, that you can become perfect by mercy, but it's not very common. Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like honorary degree, right? Did you get honorary degree from the university, Padmalochan? Did you get honorary degree? No. No. So, 
a clever man, an intelligent man. He didn't get honorary degree, right? Did you get honorary degree? No? Why not? Rabindranath Tagore, he got honorary degree, right? He's special, right? <laughs> Oxford University called him, come, we will give you doctorate. So, well, of course, some, some men, they, they give a lot of money. If you give enough money, you may get honorary degree. <laughs> there was one man in Hong Kong. He, he was a very wealthy man. He had a big hotel, big holiday inn. He owned a holiday inn. So he donated some money, big sum of money to university. So they honored him. They gave him honorary degree. Not very common. Right? So the same way in devotional service, to get honorary degree, to get mercy, kripa siddha, very rare. Prabhupada said, just like somebody comes, hits you in the chest, here, a check, ten million dollars, take it. Is it very common? Not very common, right? It didn't happen to anybody here. We wouldn't be sitting here, right? <laughs> 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 uh, that prophecy, that is Kripa Siddha. Mercy, causeless mercy comes. So we don't, how are we going to get Siddha? How are we going to get perfection? We, we have to endeavor. That is called sadhana. We do sadhana. Practice of the regulated principles of devotional service. Following the different principles, the rules and regulations. And by doing like that, by practicing in this way, gradually, we can also become perfect. We can come to the perfect stage. And it's not so difficult. Not so bad as it sounds, if all rules and regulations. We only have four. <laughs> if you go to Buddhism, they have hundreds. They can hardly follow any of them. You know, we've only got four principles, four rules. You know, not very difficult. Prabhupada said, not very difficult. Very, and it, it, it's, it is also joyful. It's a nice experience actually coming, chanting, dancing, taking prasadam. You know. It probably say this is a movement of recreation. Just simply enjoyment. But by practicing in this way, we can come to the perfect stage. We can come to experience our actual spiritual nature and our relationship with Krishna is awakened. Krishna begins to reciprocate more, enlightening us from the heart, giving us the knowledge by which we can come to him, taking away the ignorance and the passion, allowing us to experience our actual spiritual nature, which is joyful. By nature, we are all meant to be joyful living entities. So we can experience this pleasure in this very lifetime without much endeavor, just simply taking part in this process regularly, hearing and chanting, following some basic principles and naturally we can come to this highest highest stage of Krishna consciousness. Okay, any questions? Any Yes Prabhu? Maharaj, you said that Rabindranath Tagore got like one sense of Kripasiddhi. But he had that special talent also. So is it that those who get Kripa Siddhi they also have endeavored hard living serious lives because otherwise it sounds a bit unfair <laughs> well how do they get Krita Siddha? yeah it's a good question <laughs> mm -hmm. 
or how did they get it? Well, they endeavored in previous lives. Certainly, the cowherd boys were described like that. That how did the cowherd boys get that position that they could sit with Krishna in the forest of Vrindavan and they could play with Krishna and they could eat the foods with Krishna and eat, share their rice with Krishna? How was it they had that good fortune? Other people, they were simply worshipping Krishna as the Supreme Brahman and some are only knowing the impersonal feature of Krishna, but these cowherd boys are so fortunate, they're able to be with Krishna and to play with him and to fight with him and, and, and enjoy so many wonderful dealings with him. And it is said, Krita Punya Punja, because they had done pious activities over many lifetimes to come to that stage. So how does one get Kripa Siddha? As you say, it may be due to previous lifetimes that they've actually endeavored. They've done something to deserve it. Otherwise, why they would get that opportunity? But yet, to get Kripa Siddha, there has to be also sadhana then. So, both are required. <laughs> you, need some, you need to have to do some sadhana to get the Kripa. It may come by, you may do sadhana, you may do a lot of sadhana, you may never get the kripa. That's the point. That don't think that you can get kripa just by doing sadhana. But still we should want to do sadhana. Whether we get kripa or not, we have to do sadhana. And the mercy may come, it may not. Narada Muni, before he became Narada Muni, as the son of the maid servant, he was traveling everywhere. He was traveling around the world. He was, his mother had been taken from the world and he was left alone. So he wandered around the world. And then at a certain point he sat down and meditated and the Lord appeared to him. And then the Lord told him that in this lifetime, you will not see me again, you know? So he got some kripa in that life. He got some special mercy. Maharaj, in case of, like, at the end of sadhana bhakti also we get kripa. So in one sense is every journey back to Godhead, in one sense kripa, Siddhi, in one sense, like, because every, without kripa we cannot go back, right? Well, there's no end to sadhana. You know, you sit at the end of sadhana. It's not that you come to the end of sadhana. You know, sadhana, sadhana continues to become sadhya. You become perfect. But even the perfect souls, they're also doing sadhana. And they also, although they're perfect, they also chant. They also take pleasure in hearing and serving. And so we don't come to the end of sadhana. But you're right, yeah, we need... You need that kripa to go back to God. But the devotee is not anxious to go back to God. He is just simply anxious for devotional service. Wherever Krishna wants to put us, that is the devotee's thinking. Is life predestined? Or are you the maker of your own destiny? Is life predestined or are we the controllers of our own destiny? Yeah. Well, yeah, we have independence. We do have free will. There is such a thing as free will that we can choose. I said between Yoga Maya and Maha Maya. Hmm? We have to choose one or the other. We either take the shelter of the material energy or we take the shelter of the spiritual energy. That's our free will. That is our free will. After that, there's no choice. It's all arranged. The happiness you get in, under Yoga Maya, under, under Maha Maya, is already fixed. It's already arranged. What is your pleasure and pains? What's going to come? It's already arranged by previous performed activities according to our karma. 
but we have free will. You want to take shelter of yoga maya, then you take up bhakti yoga. You and then there also under yoga maya, then there's a particular arrangement. We have a particular position under the spiritual energy. We will have some particular rasa with Krishna. You know, somebody may be dasya servant. Someone may be in friendship, someone may be even in parenthood or conjugal love, different rasas. So that's also fixed. We have our particular rasa, it's also there. It's not for us to, to choose, it's already there. We have our eternal position in relation to Krishna. But we have the free will to choose between the material and the spiritual energy. And as soon as we decide material energy, and then that's it. Then the happiness and is already arranged. So, we can't do much about it, except surrender to Krishna. You take shelter of Krishna, then it's all finished. Leave the material energy. Yeah? So we have to make proper use of our free will. Prabhupada said, God helps those who help themselves. Then he said, if you want to help yourself, surrender to Krishna. Self help. Hmm? Our books are all on self-help, surrender to Krishna. Okay, any other questions? Prabhu? Uh, on the topic of uh, sadhana and uh, kripa. So, from the songs or from what we hear, it's always intertwined because we may not, the, the, the sadhaka may not be seeking mercy to go back to Godhead, but seeking mercy to continue becoming, to realize himself in Krishna Das, to continue with his devotional service. Even for that, you know, so they are, they are, we are doing the, whatever is asked of them, including Sabina, so that by somehow you get mercy in order to, to do this devotional service. So th it seems it, we are always begging for that mercy by and, uh, doing whatever is told we are hoping that we will get that mercy in order to, to continue doing devotional service. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're definitely correct that there's a, a higher aspect of mercy that we simply want mercy to do more devotional service. That is very high level of pure devotional service. One is not simply thinking that I will do devotional service and get mercy to get back to Godhead just to get me out of the material world, which is more motivated towards one's own personal self-interest. But if the mood is more for the pleasure of Krishna, then that's a higher level of devotional service. But, yeah, there's still the concept of mercy. We have to, you're right, the, the, the two are certainly interrelated, the sadhana and the mercy, just like in Damodar Leela, it said Mother Yashoda was trying to bind up Krishna, but the rope was always two fingers short. And the Acharyas described that the two fingers represent the sadhana and the mercy. And both are required to actually control, to, to, to fully engage effectively in Krishna's service. We need to do the sadhana, we need also mercy. Now mercy comes not only from Krishna himself, but also from the devotees. We get the mercy from the devotees. In fact, the devotees are more merciful than Krishna. Krishna rarely gives devotional service. Why? Because Krishna becomes controlled by one who is his pure devotee. Krishna became the charioteer for Arjuna. 
Krishna has to deliver the message from Maharaj Yudhisthira. To, 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 he has to go to Dhritarashtra and ask them not to fight. Krishna becomes obliged to his devotees. So Krishna does not give devotional service so easily. But the devotee of the Lord is more merciful than Krishna. Because they want to bring everyone to Krishna's shelter. And we say, by the mercy of the spiritual master, one gets the mercy of Krishna. The spiritual master is more merciful. They give the mercy. Brahmanda Brahmiti Konya Bhagyavanji Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lata Beach. They put the seed of devotion in the heart of the devotee. Of not, well, not devotee, they put the seed in the heart of the conditioned souls. They put the seed of bhakti in the heart to bring them to devotional service. So that is mercy. We get the mercy of a devotee. The devotees give us some Krishna consciousness. They give us some opportunity to engage in some service for Krishna. They give us some agyata sukriti. They give us that chance to do something pious, which brings us to Krishna consciousness. So you get the mercy from a devotee. It's much easier than getting from Krishna. Rare to get the mercy from Krishna. But devotees are very kind very merciful, give the mercy everywhere, giving everyone the opportunity to come to Krishna consciousness. Yes, an important point, the mercy of the devotee. Yes, Prabhu? Maharaj, you also mentioned about austerity. So when we when we look at the way Prabhupada encouraged devotees, in the in the beginning he fed them lot of prasad, he fed them, you know, and then he uh, then he motivated them to take to austerity. So how do we understand this from a from a overall human psychological perspective? That uh, because our natural tendency of uh, in human being is to look for enjoyment. So how does how do we get from that kind of tendency of enjoyment to a tendency to perform austerity? Yes, good question. So Prabhupada, you know, he, Prabhupada was very cunning in his presentation of Krishna consciousness. That is Prabhupada's tricky, you see, that he gave them enjoyment. Eat prasadam. Eat, eat more. Take more. Prabhupada had his big jar of iskon bullets, gulab jamins. He's feeding them and he's cooking more and more chapatis and rotis and everything and feeding the devotees, eat more, eat more. Because he knew that if they become attached to prasadam, they won't give up Krishna consciousness very easily. You see? So he got them attached to prasadam. And prasadam is not different from Krishna. So becoming attached to prasadam was what kept them in Krishna consciousness, that they could never go away. Even though they wanted sense enjoyment, they thought there would be no prasadam. I won't get prasadam anymore. They thought, how can I live without prasadam? So Prabhupada got them to become attached to Krishna in the form of prasadam and then gradually Prabhupada introduced the rules and regulations. <laughs> gradually. Right? So like that, that is preaching, you see. You first of all get people attached to Krishna. The rules and regulations give later, gradually, little bit, little bit. Yeah. So Prabhupada was very tricky, <laughs> tricked everybody. 
Yes, come, chant and dance, me happy. So people got real taste. They got the taste for prasadam. And they got the taste for the holy name. They never wanted to give up. So austerity, where is the austerity in Krishna consciousness? Austerity, eating prasadam is not a great austerity. You know? Okay. Eat prasadam, kirtan. Auster where is the austerity? Prabhupada never told everybody have to do austerity. He said, no, eat prasadam, chant Hare Krishna, wake up in the morning, okay. Not great austerity. Little practice. Hmm. Some little changes, but austerities. Austerity is uh, destroyed by intoxication. Well, Prabhupada taught everyone that this intoxication, this is not sense gratification. This is degradation. <coughs> this is destroying the human life. This is the ignorance of the human life that people become intoxicated. They want to drink alcohol. Alcohol's most disgusting thing. Horrible, smelly, makes people vomit and sick. And they spend so much money to drink it. They wake up the next day with headaches and feeling terrible. What, is that enjoyment? Is that sense gratification? No. So the devotees began to understand that there was no real enjoyment in the material world. Prabhupada was giving the real enjoyment, Krishna consciousness. So giving up the material world is not very difficult. If we actually see the material world for what it is, it's not very difficult to give up. You're thinking the sense gratification there, we want to enjoy. The bodies are enjoying. Nobody's suffering. Nobody's suffering here. We don't force people. You have to stay here. Well, people are happy. They come here freely. They chant, dance, eat prasadam. They're happy. Material world people are not happy. They're just suffering. They put on a smile. Oh, I'm happy. They don't know what is real happiness. The illusion, just the illusion of happiness. Maharaj, you gave the anecdote of uh, Srila Prabhupada told, no, uh, asked me whatever question. And then if someone, someone asked, you know, what's the cure for cancer? And Prabhupada said, Chant Hare Krishna. So how do we understand that that's the perfect time? Well, actually it's true. If people would chant Hare Krishna, then they'd get free of all these anxieties and all stresses, all these mental problems which are causing all this cancer. A lot of this cancer, this disease all come about because so much attachment and so much anxiety to the material world. They're so much absorbed in the body and the, and the results of their work and they're, it's causing them so much mental agony it uh, brings on the cancer. So if people would chant Hare Krishna and become Krishna conscious, they wouldn't have that problem <coughs> so much. Not a bit, not for, not a problem for the bodies. Now sometimes a devotee may get cancer. That's the arrangement of Krishna. For a, when a devotee gets something like that, it's the arrangement of Krishna to take the Krishna wants the devotee to go sometimes to go some other place to do service. So he arranges some disease like that to take them out of this material body to go some other place. 
so they can go on and do devotional service. So for a devotee, it's not a big problem. The body understands Krishna's plan. Surrender to Krishna. Okay, so we will stop here today. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Yai. Shri Prabhupada ki. Yai. Hari Hari Bo. Yai. Solas Bhakti Vigna Vinash Darshan Maharaj ki. Yai.